Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. All right, welcome everyone. Um, so, David Lewis, uh, a loving presence here at the GBF for a very long time, and um, as certainly ever since I started coming seven years ago. Um, he's been following the Dharma path for 49 years. Um, he's a graduate of Spirit Rocks Meditation Center's Advanced Pr Practitioners Program. Uh, part of, he gives Dharma admission Dharma and insight Dharma on upper market, insight upper market Sangha and leads a weekly drop in meditation for seniors, which, um, there's information on that posted in the chat box. So at this time, let me turn it over to our lovely David Lewis. Thank you, Grisha. It's wonderful to be back and see a lot of friendly faces and old friends. Um, this is something of a anniversary for me at GBF. Uh, I was here, I spoke last summer, but a year ago, a year ago minus two weeks, or is it plus two weeks, on March 1st, 2020, um, I spoke at GBF, and the, I was the last live speaker uh, before we went into shelter in place. That was on March 1st, 2020, so we're coming up on an anniversary. And it, I was reflecting on that yesterday, and really just kind of blown me away, when I, as, as I think might be true for many of you, reflecting back on the past year. Uh, it's a lot of water under the bridge. And one of the things I remembered was uh, coming into that meeting on March 1st, you know, not knowing that we were going to be sheltering in place uh, very soon. And uh, Jeff Lind Lindemood, who's, who's here today. Hi, Jeff. Uh, I got there early, and Jeff came up and gave me a lovely big hug. And uh, I remember thinking at the time, well, I wonder if this is okay now. Hugs. <laughs> it's how naive I was, as we all were at the time. And I probably got more hu other hugs that day, but uh, that first one from Jeff is, is one that I remembered. And, and Jeff, that hug has been sustaining me for, the, for a year. One of the things I realized yesterday is that's quite possibly the last direct human contact I've had in a year was being at GBF, um, March 1st, last year. So, um, thank Buddha, I at least have my little dog, who you might see on the bench behind me, uh, give me a little um, sentient being contact. So, it is indeed Valentine's Day, and I'm not going to talk about love. Well, I hope you're not disappointed. Uh, the reason I'm not, uh, well, a reason that I'm not is that uh, the Buddhist concept of love is quite different than the Western Romantic concept of love. And as I understand it, Valentine's Day is um, traditionally, since the Middle Ages, kind of is based on romantic love, uh, which is a very beautiful thing, a really wonderful thing that I hope all of us have experienced one or more time and times in our lives. But it's um, ephemeral. It's temporary. And that's the reason it's not emphasized in Buddhism, that kind of love. Um, there are other different concepts of love in, in Buddhism. And um, I just I have a short quote that I wanted to share before I move on. Being is the source of love, because learning to love means learning to be content with the life you have been given. Being fully present to what is, 
without judging or evaluating or wanting something different is the most basic act of love. That's from C.W. Huntington, Jr. And that's more of a Buddhist uh, description of love. So um, if you have any questions you'd like to talk about love or ask about the Buddhist version of love or versions of love, um, feel free to in Q&A afterwards. But today I want to focus on uh, something, a, a virtue that's valued even more than love in Buddhism, and that's wisdom. In fact, it's wisdom that brings us to the various types of love that we recognize in Buddhism. So wisdom is uh, fundamentally important in Buddhism. So as within wisdom, there's a lot of different ways of talking about wisdom, but within definitions of wisdom, um, one of the things that I'd like to focus on is the different ways of learning, the three different types of wisdom that the Buddha talked about. The Buddha taught that there are three different modes of learning. No matter what you're learning, whether it's you know, how to wash the dishes as a kid or how to learn Latin and high school or uh, how to do your job. The three different types of learning are study, including reading books, listening to talks like this from teachers. The second is reflection, thinking about some topic or idea. And the third is meditation or internalization of our direct experience of reality. Those are the three types of learning that the Buddha talked about. The first two are primarily cognitive activities. The third is achieved through the direct experience of perception. All three are important and worthwhile. We're just more conditioned to the first two, right? So this is why the Buddha emphasized the third meditation, or wise discernment in his teachings. As Jimi Hendrix said, knowledge speaks, but wisdom listens. The first two types of learning are more about knowledge. The third, meditation, is about listening. There's a reverence in many, many cultures for the kind of wisdom that comes with age. This is obviously not the case for everyone. We all know are older people who are not particularly wise. But when it is the case, it is often it often has nothing to do with learning or academic achievement. It's the wisdom of life experience. Older folks that I've admired, like my grandmother, for instance, were adept at not being too attached. They learn from life experience that bodies, relationships, families, circumstances, life circumstances change. So it's wise not to be too attached. This includes attitudes about life and death. You don't have to be a Buddhist to appreciate the lessons of the heavenly messengers. So speaking of the heavenly messengers, um, when I was working on this talk on the last week, I was reflecting on um, death, as I try to do every day, as the Buddha recommends. It makes us more appreciative of what we have in life. And as most of you know, I've been living with AIDS for 35 years now, half my life almost. And then this new pandemic came along, and starting about March last year, I thought, well, maybe this is the one that'll take me out. I really was quite open to the potentiality that I might, I might not survive this year. So when I was reflecting on that, which is the second type of learning, reflection, it raised fear, which is and some anxiety, which is um, 
uh, not unfamiliar to me, having lived with AIDS for 35 years. A little trepidation. Like, what's that mean? We're talking about the future. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know when I'm going to die or what of. So when we project into the future like that, uh, very often anxiety arises. But then I sat with it. Sat with the idea of death, life and death. Change, essentially. And I meditated. And in meditation, my direct experience is of thoughts coming and going, sounds coming and going, bodily sensations changing, everything ephemeral, everything changes. There's no constancy. It's one of the... Uh, one of the clear comprehensions that we gain when we let go of um, wanting meditation to be a certain way and simply noticing what happens, what we notice is that everything changes, right? It's flux. That kind of impermanence, that ephemeral ability, that death doesn't scare me at all. I'm quite comfortable with that. And then if I go back to reflecting again after meditation, and I realized that the planets are always changing, the universe is changing, the solar system, everything's spinning, suns are dying and being born. In my body, bodies of all sentient beings, cells are not dying and being born every moment of the day. Everything's changing all the time. It's nature. It's the way things are supposed to be. So the wisdom... I gain from the third type of learning through meditation on direct experience teaches me there's nothing to be feared from death. So that's just an example of how um, I work with the three different types of learning and how the third meditation is more of a wisdom vehicle for me than the first two. You don't have to study. You don't have to read suttas. You don't have to learn Pali to follow the Buddha's path. The Buddha taught for 40 years, and most of his teachings, are, which are called suttas, most of his teachings are instructions. Instructions about abiding in the present moment and clearly comprehending the nature of things, from our own minds to the world around us, internally and externally. Many profound Buddhist masters from the past have been illiterate. We are prone to ignorance and tempted into delusion by overcognizing or thinking too much. We can be led astray in the first type of learning by teachers, like me for that matter, who may not have a complete or accurate understanding of the Dharma. One Buddhist, famous Buddhist sutta, uh, it's about the Buddha's visit to the, the Kalamas. The Kalamas were a group of people, a village. The people were called the Kalamas. Uh, the Buddha and his retinue showed up um, one day in the village, and the Buddha prepared to teach, to give a talk. He gave this talk, and afterwards, the first question from somebody in the village said, well, why should we believe you? There's some other guy was came through here last week and he said, gave a completely different kind of a teaching. And why should we follow yours rather than his? And the Buddha said, you shouldn't. You shouldn't take my word just because I said it. You should check it out in your own experience and see whether this works for you. So the Buddha's talk was the first type of teaching. He gave a talk. The second type of teaching, he invited people to indulge in, reflect on this. And then he taught meditation. The Buddha said, be islands unto yourselves, refuges unto yourselves. Seek no external refuge with a Dhamma, which is the truth, with the Dhamma as your island, the Dhamma as your refuge, seek no other refuge. So 
So we can be equally led astray by the second type of learning, our own reflections or cognitive activity. This could be the most pernicious form of fake news. The stories that we tell ourselves about our self-worth, our goodness or badness as humans, and our projections about what other people think of us. In our quest for meaning, we are prone to make stuff up that seems to make sense. But it may very well not be true. And this is how we end up in therapy, right? A good question about any judgment that we make about ourselves or others is, is this true? Is this true? Thich Nhat Hanh said, Understanding does not arise as a result of thinking. It is a result of the long process of conscious awareness. Sometimes understanding can be translated into thoughts, but thoughts are too limited to carry much understanding. It's harder to go astray with the third type of wisdom, that of reflective awareness of our direct experience. This is why the Buddha emphasized it. It is a very simple, and there are not many options. Either we are aware of our breath, our body, our mental habits, or we're not. Another sutta that I'd like to quote, um, which is one of my favorites, it's the Bahia Sutta. And there's a long story behind it. It's a, it's a beautiful story, but um, too long for me to tell. Essentially, Bahia was a, a very wise man, apparently a teacher in his own right in a different part of India. And he heard about the Buddha and heard that there's this great teacher with a transformative teaching. Um, and he wanted to know what the Buddha had to teach, what the Buddha had to say. So he traveled across India to find the Buddha. Went through many hardships, including a shipwreck. And he finally found the Buddha and asked him three times, which is um, a repetitive tradition in the suttas of asking the Buddha three times to teach before he actually does. Um, and the Buddha finally consented to give a teaching to Bahia, and he you know, perceived the Buddha, that Bahia was a very learned man, smart guy, and he had a lot of um, a lot of wisdom. But something was missing. Bahia was not awake, and the Buddha's instructions to Bahia were profoundly simple. It's one of the most it's one of the simplest distillations of the Buddhist teachings given anywhere in the suttas. The Buddha said, herein Bahia, you should train yourself thus. In the seen will be merely what is seen. In the heard will be merely what is heard. In the sensed will be merely what is sensed. In the cognized will be merely what is cognized. In this way, you should train yourself Bahia. And when Bahia, for you, in the seen is merely the seen, and the cognized is merely the cognized, then, Bahia, you will not be attached to that. And when, Bahia, you are not attached, then, Bahia, you will not become that. And when, Bahia, you have not become that, then, Bahia, you will neither be here, nor beyond, nor in between the two. Just this is the end of suffering. Bahia became enlightened upon hearing this profoundly simple, simple teaching. For many of us, especially those that are new to Buddha Dharma, this teaching seems too simple and too straightforward to be true. How can simply knowing that you are hearing enlighten you? It's because it's the knowing that is important, the direct experience of awareness. That's what the Buddha is emphasizing. The Buddha wasn't so interested in what we know. 
but in awareness and knowing. Especially we Westerns are very skeptical of this. I think that's why Buddhism is such a minority religion. It's too simple. Kalu Rinpoche, who's a Tibetan teacher, um, outlined four faults of awareness or four problems people have with awareness. It's so close, you can't see it. It's so deep, you can't fathom it. It's so simple, you can't believe it. It's so good, you can't accept it. The name of our species is Homo sapiens sapiens, beings that know that they know. All sentient beings are aware, for instance, aware of pleasure and pain. But only humans can be aware that we are aware. The Buddha believed that this is what makes us particularly ripe for awakening. So meditation is not just about calming the mind. It's so much more than that. It's about seeing clearly and understanding the very nature of reality. When we learn to see clearly, not by memorizing or cognizing, but rather by training the mind to let go of its beliefs and attachments. Zen Master Dogen said of this, you should cease from practice based on intellectual understanding, pursuing words and following after speech, and learn the backward step that turns your light inwardly to illuminate yourself. I love that quote. Even though I don't entirely agree that we should cease from intellectual understanding, I don't know if we can do that. And I find intellectual understanding to be very supportive and motivating in my practice. But I love the metaphor he uses in that quote of taking the backward step, stepping back rather than leaning forward. It seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? We get more by doing less. As Kalu Rinpoche put it in the previous quote, it's so simple. We cannot believe it. One of, the, <clears throat> one of the adjustments that people new to meditation have to make is letting go of their desire to get something. We want to be tranquil or enlightened or perhaps get rid of our demons. But the Buddha's instructions are about taking a step back and letting go rather than striving, letting go, rather than getting something. Adyashanti says, it's not what you think, it's much, much less. It's not what you think, it's much, much less. So thinking is not the problem. Believing that we should not be thinking is what gets us into trouble in meditation. The most common complaint in my beginning meditation class is thoughts keep arising and everything keeps changing and it's totally out of control. Well, exactly. Many of us come to this practice with strong expectations about what we thought we were supposed is supposed to happen. So we were disappointed when we tried. That's how we lose a lot of people in the that come to meditation is they close their eyes and get quiet and what happens is not what they expected to happen. So they think they're doing it wrong or they made some mistake or they can't meditate. I hear that all the time. I can't meditate. Meditation is nothing more than paying attention to what's happening in your current experience. Anybody can do that. When people say they can't meditate, I believe what they're really saying is what's happening is not what I expected to happen. 
So therefore, the first lesson is letting go of our expectations. Those of us who stick it out do so by learning to give up, trying to control the chaos and simply witnessing its nature. Watching the jumble of a busy mind is a priceless lesson in the nature of being human. We directly experience the truths of impermanence, of suffering, or wanting things to be other than they are, and the truth of not-self. It's all changing. There's no me in there. And we grow in wisdom. One goal of practice is to let go of our deeply conditioned craving, which is wanting to get something. Aversion, letting go of aversion, which is wanting to get rid of something. And letting go of delusion, which is not seeing things as they are. This is the work of wisdom or wise discernment. And those, at least in the beginning, are the three most important topics. Seeing the nature of craving, aversion, and delusion. It has been said that all the evil in the world, all the problems in the world, everything that's wrong, rises out of craving, aversion, and or delusion. All the problems in our own lives, craving, aversion, and delusion. So this is the work of wisdom. The other purpose of wise discernment is helping us to differentiate what leads to happiness from what leads to suffering in our lives. This investigation can become a central part, should become a central part of our daily practice, both on and off the cushion. For any thought we entertain or any action that we propose, we can pose the question, does this lead to suffering or to an end of suffering? I mentioned at the beginning, um, said a few words about love and the difference between romantic love that is celebrated on Valentine's Day and Metta, or universal unconditional love, which the Buddha talked about. Um, the first is ephemeral. Romantic love is ephemeral. It rarely lasts. The second can become a permanent feature of our mind state with practice. The beautiful quality of metta is not ephemeral. It's not impermanent. So that's another use of wisdom is differentiating between what leads to suffering, what brings an end to suffering. And understanding that difference allows us to make better choices in life, more wise choices. It's not that romantic love is a problem. It's a beautiful thing. But if we understand that it changes, it transforms, it's ephemeral, like most everything else, we don't get so attached. And when we're not so attached, we suffer less. The Tibetan teacher, Mingyur Rinpoche, says, the insight that the Buddha discovered is so simple and yet so difficult to accept. His teachings introdu introdu introduce us to a dormant, hidden, unrealized part of ourselves. This is the great paradox of the Buddhist path, that we practice in order to know what we already are, therefore attaining nothing, getting nothing, going nowhere. We seek to uncover what has already been here. We seek to uncover what has already been here. Which reminds me of a Dharma talk I gave some years ago at a GBF retreat. 
Um, and it's one of my personal favorite Dharma talks when I reflect back on talks I've given in the past. Um, I use the, the movie The Wizard of Oz as a metaphor for being on the Buddhist path. And as you may remember, I think most of us probably know it, in the Wizard of Oz story, uh, Dorothy, Dorothy is restless, unhappy, frightened, and uh, wants to leave her world and go to another world, which she does through the accident of a tornado. She's taken to another world, and she steps onto the path of wisdom. And on that path of wisdom, she meets uh, spiritual friends, Kalyanamita, other travelers in the path who all also, like Dorothy, thought they were not complete thought they did not have a brain or wisdom, thought they did not have a heart or compassion, thought they did not have courage to deal with life's problems. And through a series of trials and tribulations and challenges, they learned together that they had those things all along. They didn't have to go on a great quest to find them. They always had them, but... Going on the quest is what allowed them to see that. And Dorothy ended up realizing that she'd always been home. She thought she'd gone away, but she'd always been home. And what she was seeking for, seeking, was always there at home. As Mingyu Ripache said, we seek to uncover what has already been here. And that's a very good description of the Buddha's path. So I think I'll end with that and um, open it up to questions and see if um, see what the wisdom of the Sangha is. If you have a question or a comment, either about love or wisdom or something altogether different, uh, feel free to put up your put up your hand. I have a question, David. Yes, Joe. Good to see you. Thank you again for another luminous talk. I'm wondering, um, do you think the meditation makes people um, able to die with more ease? Well, um. Junior Suzuki, who was the founder of the Zen Center here in San Francisco, was once asked when he was giving a talk, a student put their hand up and asked, said, why exactly are we meditating anyway? And his answer was, so we can have a pleasant old age. Hmm. So I think that also applies to death. Yes. Um, I haven't died yet, so I don't have a direct experience of that. <laughs> so I can't definitively answer it. But as I gave in my example, um, I have a lot of experience fearing death. I've uh, been near death a couple of times in my life. Um, and I've gone through times of being very accepting about the concept of death and other times where it just gives me chills. But my meditation practice, my direct experience of impermanence, you know, we can intellectually understand impermanence. That's the first type of wisdom. But if we directly experience impermanence and realize that our bodies, our cells, our mind are constantly changing, our world is changing, every, we're completely surrounded by death. In this world, there's a wonderful quote from the Mahabharata, which I don't have memorized, uh, the Hindu scripture, Mahabharata, of, um, of how ridiculous it is that we fear death because we're completely surrounded by death. We see it every day. It's the most natural thing in the world. Why should we fear it? Uh, and it's my experience that meditation uh, makes that much easier, makes acceptance of death easier. When we simply think of death, when we cognize it, um, for me, that creates anxiety 
Grace Fear. Any other comments or questions or like to share your experience? Jeff, hi. Hi, good to see you again. Thanks for that hug a year ago. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. Uh, this is a question I, I've all, I always have, uh, you know, it's a recurring one, but today you, you answered it and, um, you, when you did, I think I was too busy formulating my question to hear the whole answer, but you refer to the eph ephemeral and the, uh, impermanent, uh, what would you call the the A or the not impermanent? The... Well, the Buddha said um, essentially the only thing that's not impermanent is nirvana, is awakening. Um, everything else, every concept, every mental activity, every physical activity, everything changes, mm -hmm. but. Nirvana is permanent, and that's how, that's the, the way that, um, we're no longer reborn in, into samsara is by achieving nirvana. Um, I like to use the, the word awakening. Um, and I think it's a much understood concept. Uh, in the first place, nirvana is what fascinates everybody about Buddhism. Like, Oh, you know, what's, what's this enlightenment about, all about? The way I experience awakening is, um, yes, I trust. I'm not enlightened, but I trust because I've met enlightened beings and I've read about enlightened beings through history, including the Buddhists. Um, I trust that that could happen at the end of the path of wisdom. Um, so I think that's a realistic goal. But I also think that awakening happens to us um, in everyday life, and we don't always know that it's happening. Very small moments of awakening. And the way I describe that is any time that you're not experiencing greed or craving, aversion or delusion, any time you're without those defilements, you're awake. And that might be something so simple that you don't realize it's happening. It's, it's, that's, that's the feeling that you might get when you, um, sit by the ocean and just get lost in the experience and of the sound and the sight of waves coming in and waves going out. Your mind stops. When the mind stops, that's a moment of awakening. And, I just, I noticed one the other, uh, yesterday morning, I was standing at my sink and doing dishes and I looked out and there's a tree with no leaves on it right now, just branches outside my window. And a hummingbird came and lit on the tree. It just was still. Just, you don't all that often see a hummingbird being still. They're usually pretty busy, like our minds, right? Mm -hmm. And the stillness of that hummingbird stilled my mind. And that was a moment of awakening. It's simply a moment of being free of greed, or aversion, or delusion. So for me, I think, I may be wrong, this is my own opinion, that um, the ultimate of, of nirvana or awakening is a permanent sense or a permanent, or a permanent state of being awake in that way. But I think it's really important for us to acknowledge these moments of awakening that we all have during the course of the day. Sometimes another example is um, I like to read, um, which is the first type of, of wisdom. Um, and I will sit in my easy chair and read for a couple of hours, get totally involved in a book, whether it's a story or nonfiction. And then for whatever reason, I get to the point where it's, it's time to stop reading and I close the book and I notice right when I close the book, okay, that activity has started, has stopped. The next activity haven't, hasn't started yet. There's just stillness. My mind is still. And I used to rush off and go off to the next activity and do something, but now I just sit 
very often I meditate for maybe just five or 10 minutes after I close the book because I want to prolong that stillness of the mind. Artists experience it. Musicians experience it. When they're, do- when they're making their art, when they're performing, composing, writing, whatever it is, uh, the mind often is stilled. And that's a moment of awakening. That can be permanent, as I understand from the, from the Buddha's teachings. Thank you. I don't know. Does that? Well, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, you said one of the goals of meditation is, uh, to be knowing, to know it when I'm smelling, I'm, I'm, I know I'm smelling when I walk, I know I'm walking. Yeah. And, uh, how is the knowing or the, the awareness, the knowing that we know, uh, um, different? Good question. Well, it's, um, knowing, uh, being interested, I was talking about being interested in the knowing rather than the, than the content of the knowing. Mm, yeah. Yes. Generally, we get caught up in the content of, of right. The yes. Um, but we can know knowing, and that's not familiar to us. Right. But you can know the act of awareness. You can know awareness. Mm-hmm. And when you sit with awareness, um, you realize that it's it's vast and it covers and it, it encompasses everything. Yeah. The same thing is true of spaciousness, actually. We talk about emptiness in Buddhism, and, and often that's not very well understood. But if you, right now, if you notice, what are you noticing in front of your eyes? You're probably, probably noticing a screen, and you're, you're, fa- you're focused maybe on faces, maybe on my face. Um, if you step back a little bit, you realize, oh, well, I'm looking at a computer. There's this machine in front of me. And then there's a wall maybe behind that. And there's furniture and there's pictures on the walls and there's things to look. That's all content. But there's space between you and that content. There's spaciousness mm-hmm. that we don't notice. When we sit and look into a, in, look around our environment, we don't notice the space unless we make a point of doing it. We don't notice the, the spaciousness that surrounds us. And that's another thing that the Buddha emphasizes, like he emphasizes knowing awareness. He emphasizes noticing spaciousness, both the space, spaciousness in the room around you and the look outside and see the clouds. And then just take your mind out to the far reaches of the universe. We're more about space, including our bodies. We're more about space than we are content. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Good question. Thank you. It tends to excite me. You might, you, you might be able to. It keeps me motivated. That's why I keep on practicing. I'm always learning, 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 learning. And yet I feel like a ranked beginner. Francis, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Dave. Have you met an enlightened person and how did you know that person was enlightened? Oh, good question, Francis. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. For one thing, it's um, early on, I was discouraged by the Buddha to his monastic community to ever claim that you're enlightened. So basically, at least in my tradition of, of Buddhism, you're forbidden to say, I'm enlightened. For one thing, you might be wrong. And for another thing, it's not up to you. It's up to a, a wiser teacher to determine. So people don't talk about it much. I have met or have experienced um, a small handful of teachers that made me wonder, like, wow, are they, are they there? Um, have they been enlightened? Um, but I don't know. You can't ask. So it's, it's, it's all speculation. Um, but also, I tend to back away from that question for the same reason that uh, why, uh, what I was trying to explain to, to Jeff is that that really emphasizes that final goal of awakening. And we think, oh, that's something that only some kind of genius that's been practicing for 70 years can have and is far away and it's not attainable to me. Um, and that's why I like to emphasize the kind of awakening that happens in our daily life. Uh, short moments, 
many times, short moments, many times. Um, I think we can directly experience, as I said before, directly experience enlightenment, tiny little bits of enlightenment in daily life. Um, and I think that's more important than asking the question about who's enlightened, who's permanently enlightened. Thank you, David. I have no doubt that there's a way people around. I just, you know, I can't say for sure who is. Thank you. Uh, it's about time to start wrapping up yeah. and asking for announcements and things. Thank you, David, very much. Um, Don is the poly word for generosity. And with your donations, we keep this sangha um, taking action in ways uh, like honorariums for our Dharma speakers, paying the rent for our space at Bartlett Street when we're there, paying for Zoom, paying for the newsletter, which is about to go out. Um, and so please be generous. And uh, suggested donation is 10 to $20. Um, are there any other announcements? Yeah, I would just like to add, Grisha, that um, my Thursday morning meditation group, meditation class, which, which is sponsored by Open House. It's a, a nonprofit that serves um, LGBTQI seniors. It's free. It's a drop-in group. It's a Zoom group. You don't have to announce. You can let anybody know that you're coming. Um, there's no cost, and everybody's welcome. You don't even have to be a senior. Mm. All right. Uh, and then, let's see, next week's speaker, Donald Asa Chan is next week. Any other announcements? All right. So, David, would you like to um, lead us in our dedication of merit? Or sure. I'd be happy to. So, um, in our dedication of merit, we acknowledge the benefit of this practice, the benefit of the teachings, the benefit of our meditation, the benefit of our fellowship together to ourselves, but we also acknowledge that um, that benefit goes beyond just this group that you see um, see in front of you. That benefit goes out to the whole community. So uh, acknowledging that benefit, we just as we wish for ourselves to be happy and wise, we wish that for all beings. We wish that all beings be free from suffering. May all beings be safe and protected from danger and harm. May all beings be uh, live with peace and ease. May all beings be healthy in body and mind. May it be so. Thanks, David. Yeah, Thanks. thank you, David. Good to see you. Hi, everybody. Thank Happy you. Valentine's Thank Day. You. David, this uh, adds a whole new meaning to the term being a friend of Dorothy's. <laughs> <laughs>Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.